What's the weirdest flex you have? TLDR. I did two days of army field exercises with busted balls. Yes, I'm dumb. So, it's a long story. So no shit, there I was, 18 years old, first year ROTC cadet, and pumped full of super hoo-ha propaganda from being raised in the south. We went to FT Bragg for our semester FTX, field training exercise. For ROTC, it was three to four days in the field, doing land navigation, rocks, small unit tactics, etc. First thing on the second day, we do an obstacle course. And there's this rope swing, you see, where you have to stand on a log, jump and grab it as it swung to you, and swing across and land on the other log. Too easy. I distinctly remember one cadet who was having a rough time. I don't know why they weren't able to do it, but the theory of rows that the knot at the bottom was too low so they couldn't get their feet on it. Bear in mind, this is like a navel rope. It is dummy thick. They spent some minutes getting the knot redone, and we got plenty of time because the group ahead of us was fighting the weaver and losing. A kid makes it across, and we are good to go. My turn comes around. I jump, I get the rope, and I feel the knot give me a swift, square hit in the balls. I land on the other side, because I'm already headed that way, step off the log, and sit down in pain. Get told we have to go and do it again. Die inside. I then proceed to do it again, knowing to aim higher. Don't jump high enough, get the reach under for the full testicular smashing. In pain, but full of my can't-let-the-team-down attitude, I carried on. After the O-course, still in pain, so I head to the porter shitters. Lo and behold, someone's replaced my jewels with a plum! My immediate thought was, that is bad. My second thought was how everyone was going to take a shot at a cadet who had already fallen out and gone home. So I just... Didn't say anything. That afternoon was full of tactical exercises with paintballs, and when the adrenaline kicked in, I was fine. But after that, I was sucking wind. Then we have a nighttime four mile ruck. That sucked. Every step hurt. On the bright side, I couldn't feel the blisters I got on day one of land nav. On the not so bright side, every step reminded me that the flesh is spongy and bruised, and very well swollen. Still don't tell anyone. Wake up the next day, six mile rock. That sucked even more, but I was in the home stretch. Get that done with and have to do a police call. My feet are shredded, shitty standard issue boots. My balls are busted and the size of a small orange with the color of a ripened plum. And I was out here limping around picking up trash. I remember one of my cadres, let's call him Major T, had stopped talking to me. I mentioned that I was hurting, not like in the, oh, I'm in agony and I have X injuries, more like of a, yeah, I'm hurting a little, and he kind of reassured me that I'll get used to the rocking and stuff as I go through with the program. That was true, sure, but at the moment I was hurting for a much different reason. I got back to campus, took a shower, and got time to clean up and give it a full inspection. I low-key panicked, and so I did what most kids do. I called my dad and asked what the fuck I should do. He told me to go to a doctor, duh, and told him to keep up to date. Had to get ultrasounds and felt very uncomfortable by way too many people. Supposedly all good, though. There, I suspect there are some lingering effects, such as lessened sensitivity now and such. Maybe it's a placebo effect, maybe it's real, but either way, all the light taps are crippling really don't bother me now. Well, apart from annoying me. I got out of PT for the rest of the semester, so that was nice. I had to waddle around everywhere until it finally started to heal. So, not nice. Owning a kind of rare car that nobody in their right mind would care about. Edit. Since some people want to know, I will write a little bit about it. It is going to be really disappointing, however. The car is a 1961 Rambler Classic Super. There used to be a lot of them, but these days, there seem to be very few. Rambler was the third best-selling American car in 1961, and the Classic was their best-selling model. It was right in the middle of their lineup between the cheaper American and the more expensive Ambassador. The Classic line was divided into three. Deluxe, which was the cheapest one for some reason, Super, and Custom, the most expensive. The importer in my country sold about 138 cars in total in 1961. I don't know how many were sold, but the Classic was the most popular by far. Many of them were used as taxis, some were CEO and director cars, and I think some of them went into the NATO service. Rambler was the best American car brand here in the 1960s. American cars are very popular here, but at the shows, you rarely see independent brands. 99% of the cars are GM, Ford, Mopar, and the majority have been imported here in later times. 
As often as this happened, nobody cared much about preserving these old funny looking boxes, and the majority were used up and scrapped. Now there's only just a handful of 1961 Ramblers left out there. I know of three registered cars, including our own. One unregistered parts car and one carcass that is rotting away out in the woods. I have asked the local club if anybody knows about more cars here in our country, but nobody has come up with anything yet. Our car is right in the middle of the 1961 lineup. It has no extra equipment whatsoever. No radio, no air conditioner. It has a 3-speed manual column shift transmission with no overdrive, and a 195.6 CID 6-cylinder engine with an aluminium block. The aluminium block got a reputation for not being their best creation, so most of them got swapped out for cast iron blocks a long, long time ago. It is a really boring and basic grocery getter from a bygone time but a mundane part of regular life that few people seem to remember. That is exactly why I like it so much. Another reason why I developed an interest in this particular brand is an episode of an old cartoon called Life with Louie. In the 90s, I worked in customer service for an airline ticket seller. They just started a website, and I was in their first internet customer service agent training. I didn't learn a thing. Anyways, as I was doing the job, I realized I was getting the same questions over and over again. The standard procedure was to email back and have to type out the same message again and again. So I, being the young tech-savvy guy, very few of us back then, I just made a window file and typed out the responses, then cut and pasted when I got those emails. So most customer service agents maybe did 30 to 40 emails a day. I was doing 200 to 250. I was doing so many that when the bigwigs were visiting the call center, the COO came to talk with me and asked me how I was able to do so many as I was. Dumb young me explained what I had done creating canned responses for the company. She asked me to email my list to her. I did, and soon the entire company was using it. I didn't get any credit, money, or promotion. Nada. I left the place about a month later because I was 18 and hated the hours. Idiot. Wow, that blew up. And for those making comments about if I had any other ideas to streamline operations, I did. The website was really bad, and as a customer service rep, I saw a lot of issues that were brought up through my interactions with customers that were easy fixes, and that would have streamlined the website and would have made sales easier. Plus, I had written an auto-reply script with most of the common FAQs that they could have added to the website, and or as a script when they made sale. They weren't doing this, and they didn't have one on their website. There were plenty of other things that are lost in 30 years that are pretty standard now, but weren't being done back then. And I had been online since 1990 or so. Back then, there were a handful of us. So I knew that most about the internet than 99.9% .9 of people who worked there slash ran the company. Two days late to the post, but here goes. I have Wolverine X-Men-like healing powers. At 46, I'm still triathlonging and lifting weights. I have not a single knee, joint, hip, ache, creak, crack, or muscle tissue. In February 2006, I was finishing my set of squats with 275 pounds for six reps. Only 5 foot 10-ish, 170. I kinda bounced with aggression to begin the set. Ouch. What the hell was that? The next day, I could not walk. Paralyzed feeling. Turned out, I sprained my vertebrae. March 2006, ran the LA Marathon without issue. 2008, major orthognatic double jaw surgery to correct my underbite. I was told I needed therapy to be able to properly open my jaw, and also the nerves in the upper jaw would never come back. Jaw function normalized. Nerves normalized. 2010, crashed my racing bicycle head-on with another cyclist, and flipped over landing on concrete and breaking my scapula with a second-degree shoulder separation. I was told it takes a car crash force to break that bone. Within six months, it's like it never happened, and resumed normal swim times and speeds. 2018, crashing bicycle again headfirst into pavement, yanking my neck and rolling over and crushing my hand in the process. Straight to the ER, head and neck severely impacted, but okay, hand required surgical repair on the metacarpal bone with screws and a rod. I was told I need therapy to resume normal hand function. Seven weeks later, I did an Olympic distance triathlon, and eventually, strength training resumed a normal hand function. My hand x-ray kinda looks like I have one Wolverine claw inside. 
So despite all my shortcomings, somehow every injury heals, and it heals like it didn't happen. Thankful for that! I completed the job card age 24 in 6 weeks and 4 days, completely finishing 2 trades in a week. Computer repair and business clerical. I already had my software slash hardware repair certificate and had associates in Microsoft Office and business administration, so tested out of each program in one day. The administrator for the campus came to my dorm room and offered me a teaching job until they replaced the computer clerical teacher who quit. I helped 30 teenagers in 5 months have associate level certifications in Microsoft and other computer certs after rewriting the entire course curriculum in a weekend, taught an entire dorm room of single parents how to cook simple dishes so they would stop setting off the fire alarms every day. I also taught a 6 week self-defense course after the school learned of my self-defense training two students tried to jump me and i tried to calm the situation and when that didn't work i used self-defense to take them down without throwing any punches i also attended the local college and earned an associate in three degree programs in less than two years automotive cosmetology and business communication I already had the core credits, and every semester I was taking 22 to 25 credit hours. My son's school tested our IQs after he tested the 5th grade for level pre-K at age 4. I found out I was a high-functioning autistic with Savant Syndrome. I got a pedophile fired from each school he ever worked at until he was eventually arrested. I was 15, and I felt there was something wrong with him. He had been messaging girls and boys in our school, asking for nudes, and I found out. He got fired because of the evidence I gave. When he got fired from our school, he took an interest in me, not knowing I was the child who snitched. I led him into believing that his life was so interesting, he told me his home address, his current occupation, and where he worked. I talked to him from age 15 to 17 and never sent him a thing, just kept tricking him into telling me where he worked and lived so I could snitch on him for being a pedophile. I sent evidence to every other school he worked at. He got fired from every single one, and he was arrested eventually. Not sure where he is now, but I checked his LinkedIn and sent him yearly reminders to all the schools not to hire him. I used to be able to tell what my girlfriend, now ex, needed slash wanted before she even did after she got pregnant. Long ass story. Like when I was 12 miles away and she said she was hungry. So I said, Wendy's? She said, yeah. So I said, the 4 for 4? Which she replied, how did you know? I asked her, eh, Frosty too? At which point she proceeded to ask me where I was. There was another time she got pregnant that we went to the gas station. There was a chicken place inside that sold blueberry and honey biscuits. And we got two of both, and some tenders and some wedges, and she ate one tender and three wedges, and was going for a biscuit when I told her not to eat it. She replied, but I want it! I told her, okay, and about two bites in, she said she was full and glared at me like I was the one to blame. Needless to say, I was a psychic to her. I have a pretty good sense at internal dead reckoning. I do have to, like, do an initial collaboration, so to speak. And it does diminish our larger scales, but generally, I always know what direction I'm facing and what distance I am relative to the point. I got my bearings and it's fairly automatic. I also build internal maps of what's around me when I'm moving around, and I just sort of know where various points of interest might be relative to my current position and starting position. It's handy for places I've never been, and I've pretty much never gotten lost, or at least unable to return to my starting point. Places like malls and amusement parks are pretty much effortless to navigate in my head, and I can scale it up to several square miles before I start getting inaccurate. I am a whiz at corn mazes! Thank you for watching the video. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content like this.